dear Mana, I'm here in Melbourne and I have decided to stay. It's better for work than in Greece. I have a job already in the city making suits. When the ship came into Port Melbourne, I remembered our home village by the sea. I will never forget it, but here I can see prospects. There are factories everywhere looking for workers. My friends say I may even find a Greek wife. Do not worry about me, your loving son, Nick. World War II marked a change in the direction of Australia's immigration history. The government planned an ambitious post-war reconstruction and expansion program, and populate or perish became the catch cry. Arthur Corwell became the first Minister for Immigration in 1945 and aimed to increase Australia's population by 2% each year. Britain was regarded as the first source of migrants and free passages were offered to ex-servicemen. Assisted passages were offered to selected citizens who were regarded as skilled migrants. Adults would pay £10 of their passage money and £5 each for any children. The £10 POM scheme continued until 1982 and brought a million British people to Australia. The devastation of war in Europe had created another source of migration. There were about two million people living in displaced persons camps in Germany, France and Austria. The Allied powers organised these people into camps and established the International Refugee Organisation to arrange resettlement. Corwell discovered that the organisation would supply vessels to transport displaced persons to Australia and signed an agreement in 1947 which brought the first group of displaced persons from the Baltic states. They were soon followed by shiploads of people of other nationalities Slovenes, Ukrainians, Yugoslavs, Czechs, Poles, Hungarians, White Russians, Albanians, Romanians and Bulgarians. The movement of displaced persons continued until 1954. This extraordinary post-war immigration program saw Port Melbourne Station Pier witnessing an average of 61,000 overseas passengers arriving annually between 1949 and 1966. Our postcard creation comes from the stories of Nick Tsingopoulos and his wife Desi, who have lived in Port Melbourne since the early 1960s and still run a tailoring business in Bay Street. I came on the Greek ship Aurelia in about 1961. I came for a holiday with my friends from Germany where I had learned the tailoring trade. It was meant to be a break from post-war Europe. I could see there were better job prospects through liaising with migrant groups and I decided to remain here. Erica Wilson was a Port Melbourne volunteer migrant worker at the Lorimer Street Migrant Hostel. When the first migrants came out, they came to a camp in Lorimer Street. It had a huge hall for the dining room, and then it had the bed sitting rooms, not huts, fibro sheets, a temporary hostel. I was sent by the Good Neighbour Council to a Scottish lady at the hostel. I had a Scottish grandmother, so I fancied myself as a Scot who could speak Scotch. So down I went, but it was very crushing. She said, good afternoon, Miss Wilson, how are you? I said, Breuil, and thank you kindly for speaking, in my best Scottish accent. The answer I got was, how dare you come down and speak to me in village Scotch. I'm an educated Scot and have my qualifications from Glasgow. On arrival in Port Melbourne, 
many other migrants boarded trains on Station Pier, which took them to the Bonagilla migrant camp on the New South Wales border. In early 1955, the Commonwealth ceased using commission ships to transport assistant migrants. By then, shipping fleets had been rebuilt after the ravages of war, and newer, larger, more comfortable vessels became available. British and European migrants travelled on ships already making regular passenger crossings, such as the Orcades, Achille Loro, Iberia and Australis. In the 1960s, the Sitmar Line introduced passenger services on large ships, such as the Fair Star and Fair Sea. For these later migrants, the journey became a kind of four-week holiday where friends were made and social activities enjoyed. The voyage itself was an introduction to different cultures. Eight-year-old Greek girl, Menka Paraskevopoulou, travelled on the Fair Star in 1954. I realised there were a lot of different people and things happening in the world. I'll never forget eating my first banana. I had never seen one before and almost ate its skin and all until a crude member showed me how to peel it. It still took some time before migrants were able to leave their vessel and proceed through customs. Marion Teal arrived at Station Pier in 1964 with her husband, children and mother. It was late at night when we arrived in Port Phillip Bay on the Ellenis. I can recall the pilots boarding the ship to steer us through the bay. Customs and immigration came on board to approve everything. It took some hours, I think. And it was past midnight when we eventually got off the ship. I can recall my mother sitting on a cabin trunk. She had put on a sun hat because her hands were so full. Lots of other passengers asked her to keep an eye on their luggage too. She looked like the last outpost of the British Empire. By the mid-1960s, it was sometimes the case that up to 10,000 people, including passengers, their friends and their relatives, were at Station Pier when one or more ships berthed there. Theophanis Emanolidis was one of the 371 Greek migrants who arrived on the Scorbrin in 1954. As he leaned over the ship's rails at Station Pier, he noticed only one person there to meet the whole ship. By August the next year, when he was able to sponsor his parents and siblings, the scene at Port Melbourne was very different. In the early 1950s, many single men had arrived as migrants. Once settled, Many looked to their homelands for brides, women they had never met but who agreed through family arrangement and the exchange of photographs to come to Australia to marry. Their prospective husbands sponsored them. Meeting in the flesh for the first time could be an ordeal. When the Melbourne Harbour Trust appointed six multilingual port hostesses to assist new arrivals at Station Pier in 1965, they found helping to introduce couples was one of their duties. Nila Gorkic, a Yugoslavian-born hostess, recalls. Anxious young men implored us to go on board and introduce them to their brides, whom they only knew from a snapshot. Sometimes the brides were reluctant to leave the ship, and I remember that the girls would say, I don't want to land. I don't want to land. I say, well, you've got to land. I mean, that's the reason you are here. Other migrants found their partners in Australia. Nick and Desi Singopoulos met through the Greek community in Melbourne. 
I left Greece to find better work opportunities and I arrived on the Carinia 1957. My auntie met me and I live with her in Clifton Hill. I work in Tyler Manufacturer in City. And part time time, because the money wasn't enough, I found a job and I work on Saturdays and fruit shop market. I began working in a furniture factory then General Motors Holden spare parts before joining the rag trade in the city where I could use my tailoring skills. We married in 1964 and we moved to Port Melbourne where we eventually bought a shop in Bay Street in 1975 and I started my own tailoring business. We remember the St. Emery Bridge on Beach Road the piers, the factories, with their smell of biscuits, Vegemite, and smell of soap, and seeing the tram trucks along Bay Street. The experience of the journey, arrival, and early years in Australia must have differed widely for the almost two million people who came here to settle between 1947 and the 1970s. It is impossible to generalise about their journeys. But for many, the pier remains significant as the place where their new life began. For some, Port Melbourne itself was not only the end of their journey, but also the place they called home. Annual arrivals in Australia reached their lowest post-war point in 1975. The hint of recession and unemployment in the 1970s led Australian governments to limit migration levels and after the fall of Saigon in 1975, a different wave of migrants began to arrive on Australia's northern shores, this time in much smaller boats. Station Pier's role as the gateway to Australia for millions of new settlers was finally over, ending in 1977 when the Greek vessel, the Australis, birthed there with her last shipload of new Australians. <laughs>